Welcome to the fifth of our Lent Reflections, based on Sam Wells' book, Power and Passion. When we look at people who were around the, the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus. We've looked at a few already. We've had Peter to start with. We've had Mary Magdalene, Pilate, and then Pilate's wife, who gets a, only a very passing mention in the Gospel accounts. And so we come to Barabbas, the bandit, the terrorist, a person that we're all quite familiar with. Barabbas, if you like, is the archetypal person who gets the get out of jail free card, you may remember from the game of Monopoly. But was he a terrorist or was he a freedom fighter? Think, at ver think of various possibilities in recent history in the 20th and 21st century. Make your own choice. Barabbas was probably not a man who'd taken a careful, cold look at his chance of success. He was likely so convinced of the rectitude of his view of the world that he thought anything was justified in pursuit of it. What should we do when we believe we're right, but the obstacles in our way are overwhelming? Barabbas was described as a bandit. Lestes, the word in Greek. It's a word that actually turns up frequently in the Gospels, surprisingly so, um, often translated simply as a robber or as the leader of an insurrection. We have Jesus in the temple saying, you've turned this temple into a den of bandits. When he's arrested in the garden, have you come uh, against me as against a bandit? In the Good Samaritan, a man fell among bandits. And then in John chapter 10, the Good Shepherd, the one that enters over the wall and doesn't come through the gate is a bandit, or po possibly a robber. The themes, the words are really interchangeable in the text. And in the passages uh, where Barabbas features, not only do we have this theme of bandits, but also a theme of purity and a theme of choice and the choices that lay before him, the disciples, the people of Jerusalem, and us as well. Roman rule was brutal and they were very successful in harnessing the support of a local elite to exercise power and control. It would have seemed in Jerusalem there was nothing the people could do. How could they respond in the face of Roman domination? Well there are probably four main options. You could collaborate that's probably the simplest way to do. If you actually want an easy life, particularly if you're from a fairly wealthy, moneyed class and you were one of the local elites, uh, the strategy of the ruling elites and the ruling classes is epitomised by Herod the Great, who was a half-Jewish king who ruled for the generation up to the time of Jesus' birth. He reconstructed the Jewish temple on a grand scale with Roman support and local enthusiasm. Yet on top of the entrance gate to the temple, the focal point of Jewish identity, Herod placed a golden eagle, the symbol of Rome. He brought in a high priestly class, some of whom were not from Judea, but from all around the world. Thus, in the time of Jesus, the Jewish leaders represented neither the people nor the empire. For those leaders, collaboration involved a sober recognition that the sovereignty of Israel was dead and buried. The restoration of successors of King David was simply a fantasy. But collaboration also required confidence that the concessions won from Rome were valuable and sustainable. Well, a series of brutal interventions from Roman governors suggested otherwise. The reality was Jerusalem and the Jewish nation was again a vassal state and there were puppets in the Roman governor's hands. An alternative approach was that of reform, for it was quite likely that literate Jews of Jesus' time would understand their situation under Roman domination has been very similar to the exile of the Jewish people um, after the, the wonderful times of under King David and Solomon, and that the exile in Babylon was the result of the people of God departing from God's ways. So they may see it as they departed from God's ways and that's why they've got the Romans. The appropriate response, therefore, is to reform Jewish ways of life and return to the holiness that God called his people. Holiness and purity were intimately connected. The Jewish people had a holy land, the land of Israel, 
and within that land were holy places arranged in a hierarchy, at the top of which was the Holy of Holies in the Jerusalem Temple. They had holy times, the weekly Sabbath, but also festival days, the Passover, the Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles. They had holy people, again in a hierarchy according to purity, with priests at the top and the physically unpaired just about at the bottom. They had bodily marks, notably circumcision, and holy food, and correspondingly impure food and impure dead bodies and bodily fluids. Now it's practically impossible for the ordinary people who work the land to keep these purity codes. The Sadducees, a political and religious party with many wealthy members, only accepted the written law of Moses. They assumed that only the priests could be really holy, which justified the maintenance of an upper class that found common cause with Rome. The Pharisees, by contrast, who usually get a bad press in the New Testament, were actually much more concerned with enabling the ordinary people to live the life they were supposed to live and reinterpreting the rules so that it was possible both to understand them and to keep them. The trouble was, as they reinterpreted them in so many myriad different ways, that unless you'd got the leisure and the time to actually observe these and you didn't work in a dodgy occupation that got you in touch with dead bodies or working on the land or things like that, you didn't have any chance really of, of uh, observing them at all, so you were back in the same position. What they were really keen about was purity and the purity of the Jewish faith. And that's where Jesus was in opposition to them. He had a very different idea of what purity involved and how it should be implied. The Essenes, by the way, had a different way of interpreting purity. It wasn't a question of simply restricting it to the few or extending it to the many. It lay in withdrawal completely into a rigorous community. Withdrawal was a statement there was no possibility of changing the existing order, but like the option of reform, the key issue was seen as restoring holy life in Israel. We know a lot more about the Essenes after the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and their purity laws. They even took it to the extreme of not using toilet facilities on the Sabbath, which would require a certain amount of self-control. As far as we can tell, they had no vision whatsoever for any kind of violent or non-violent engagement uh, with the Roman occupying powers, which of course couldn't be said for this fourth group. The bandits, the restorationists, the revolutionists, it's a bit of an anachronism, uh, revolutions of modern era have been undertaken by those who assumed the old way of doing things was bad, and a new one not only possible but necessary, that the golden era lay in the future. Such a view was inconceivable in Jesus' time. It was universally assumed that the golden era lay in the past, and all that could be desired was a restoration of that blessed order, generally thought to be a restoration of the rule of King David and that blessed time of a thousand years before Christ. This was the vision of the zealots. This was the vision of people like uh, Barabbas, as far as we can tell. Uh, even one of Jesus' disciples was known as a zealot in the past. They were as angry with the Jerusalem authorities as they were with the Romans. The whole structure needs to be pulled down and replaced, preferably by them. The zealots could include landowners, they could include uh, the lower orders of the priestly classes, and also around them could be gathered slaves and others who had little to gain from staying within the law whether Roman law or temple law, and this latter group were known as the bandits. Or to such people, the idea of restoring a long-buried kingly line, of returning to older laws, restoring a previous generation of notables, was very appealing indeed. In one sense, it didn't so much want a new era, a complete overthrow, um, a complete new agenda for life. What they wanted was a change of government. They wanted the rich elite who are running things out and the workers in charge. In comparison to Jesus' programme, the zealots challenged not too much, but too little. The problem was not what they wanted to change, but how much they assumed would stay the same. And the problem with the violent methods the zealots used was likewise not that they were too strong, but that they were actually too weak. Whether Barabbas was formerly a zealot or not, we don't know. But let's look at the way the Gospel accounts treat of Barabbas. First of all, Matthew's, who's by far the most lengthy and informative. Matthew chapter 27. 
Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of envy they'd handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. And they all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw he was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. And all the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. And then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Notice we've got two Jesuses here. We've got Jesus the Messiah and Jesus Barabbas. The word Barabbas, Bar Abbas, son of a father. And whether that means that they didn't know who his father was and he was illegitimate, we don't know. But that sort of prefix before a name is very common in the Semitic languages. In Aramaic, Jesus' language, it's Bar. So Barabbas is son of a father. In Hebrew, it would be Ben. In Arabic, it would be Bin or Ibn, depending whether the word is at the start of the sentence or not. But it is a very common construction. So you have Jesus, as we would understand, son of, of God, and Jesus, son of a father. Which one do you want me to release to you? So for Matthew, this is an issue of choice. And it's a stark one. And it's one with a large audience. Like the last scene of a play, it seems as if every character has found their way back to the stage. We've got the Roman governor, the colluding Jewish authorities, the restorationist zealot, the wavering crowd. The only ones missing are the disciples. Significantly, the scene is played out on Roman territory and according to Roman rules. Like at the end of a gladiator contest, which generally took place between condemned criminals or those who'd fought against Rome. So the choice is between two Jesuses, one who seeks peace, the other who practices violence. And as Matthew puts it, the reader has a choice between these two alternative readings of the nature of Jesus' threat to Rome. The church has a perpetual choice, as Sam Wells puts it, as which Jesus to follow. And uncompromisingly, Matthew hammers it home. Pilate tries pitifully to evade it, but there's no doubt, but by the end of this scene, the choice offered at this moment in history is the definitive choice that exposes the truth about each one of us. Mark's much shorter account in Mark chapter 15 makes it clear that the crowd's choice is between two kinds of revolutionary. Do you want a revolutionary that doesn't assume that others must die that he may be free? that recognises that he must die, that others may be free. Freedom is not worth killing for, but it is worth dying for. And Jesus does exactly what he expects his followers to do. He denies himself and takes up his cross. He is the real revolutionary because he promised a totally new empire, not the rule of Caesar, but the kingdom of God, a completely new form of rule. Not revolution, but resurrection. I wonder what happened to Barabbas after he'd been dealt his get-out-of-jail-free card. Did he go back to his mates, rejoicing in his unexpected fortune, get dreadfully drunk, return to his old ways, and eventually, possibly, got lifted again, and eventually was executed? Or maybe he thought he'd had such a lucky escape. He didn't really know much about why he'd had a lucky escape. 
but he realised that if he kept his head down, he'd probably be all right. Although I guess he'd be a marked man as far as the authorities were concerned from then on. Or maybe he looked at what happened immediately afterwards. And this man, Jesus the Messiah, crucified on a cross between two other bandits who he may well have known, maybe even have known quite well. And one of whom threw insults in the face of Jesus, determined to still go his own way. But the other one looked to Jesus and touched him metaphorically, came to him and said, Remember me when you come in your kingdom. I've seen that actually your way is the only way, the only way to purity, the only way to health, the only way to what we might call salvation. I wonder if he observed that and whether he did anything about it. We'll never know. Jesus, of course, completely transformed uh, any understanding of purity. He was overturning notions left, right and centre. The Pharisees see his disciples eating food without ritually washing their hands. And Jesus says nothing outside of you can defile you by going into you. Rather, it's what comes out of you that defiles you. But the first miracle that's recorded in John's Gospel, they're turning the water into wine at Cana in Galilee. It's the water of purification, the water to make you clean and holy has become the wine of the kingdom, the wine of that joyous banquet in the kingdom of God. Simon the Pharisee criticised Jesus for letting a really dodgy woman wash his feet, an action which has always struck me as being really highly erotic. And Jesus says to the woman, though, your sins are forgiven. He meets a woman in his ministry who's been bleeding for 12 years, um, a menstrual disorder, and therefore has been permanently unclean. She comes up behind Jesus and just touches the hem of his garment and is immediately healed. Under Jewish law, Jesus has been rendered unclean by the touch of that woman. Actually, Jesus has cleansed the woman. Jesus' holiness is highly contagious the woman only had to touch the hem of his garment and she was healed. The penitent bandit was promised by Jesus that he would be cleansed and this day he would be with him in paradise. I wonder, where is it that we might feel impure today? How do people around us, people in the parish, what is it that gives them a sense of being unclean and unworthy? And I wonder, how does the church make some people feel unpure also? What do we need to do to be like Jesus and to be an instrument of purity to others by our infectiousness? To use Leslie Newbigin's phrase, to be a sign, instrument and foretaste of the kingdom of God to others. So as we finish, some thoughts to ponder. I wonder what it's like to be told that you are impure. I wonder what it's like always to have a sense of a golden era in the past when everything was just right. And I wonder what it's like to look back and realise everything depended on one choice. Lord God of transforming grace, we pray for all who live under tyranny, national, cultural or domestic. Help us to recognise before you the ways our lives deny your son's transformation. Our obsession with forms of purity that do not reflect your compassion and forgiveness. Our offering of and demand for sacrifices that do not bring reconciliation or make us holy, and our resort to hasty and violent solutions to profound and common problems. 
Make us a people who learn how to choose well, and seek your society among outcasts, your rule among servants, and your power in the resurrection of your Son, so that when we stand in the crowd on the day of reckoning, we may sing not the song of Barabbas, but of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.